today Ketan Charlan will present the theme, The Fatherhood of God and the Brotherhood of Men. Now, let me briefly introduce you Ketan. Ketan Charlan has been a reader and student of Virantia Book since 1979. He started attending study groups in 1987 and started two study groups in 1999. One stopped a couple of years ago when his mother died, and the other one at his home is still going on strong with many members. Getan was president of Urantia Association International from 2003 to 2013. After serving terms as local and national association, association's president for years. He now serves as associate trustee for Urantia Foundation and is also a member of the Urantia Association International Governance Committee. He has a strong interest in study groups and any courses promoting teachers for Urantia book teachings. Thank you, Gaetan, for your exemplary willingness to serve. The session is yours now. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you, Jeannie. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, as, a, as a start, I want to tell you I'm not an expert on the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men. Why I accepted to do this webinar and why I wanted to choose that theme is because uh, I've been exploring that concept for a few years now. And I realized that I'm, a, I'm still in the beginning of it. There's many things I need to learn about it. And I hope to learn all those little things that are missing in my, my journey toward living this tremendous truth about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men from you all. So I will ask you during this presentation to share with me and with the rest of the people over here your concept of how you apply this in life. I'm much interested in how this truth is transforming your life, how it affects your life, how it affects your family life, how it affects your relationship with your, your family members, your coworkers, your friend, your neighbor, the people you meet here and there. And how do you perceive all those truths in your life in everyday life? And how do you make it living, a living truth? This is what I'm interested in. Uh, when we read the Rensha book, of course, we have all those concepts. And I will share some of those with you in my presentation. I have a PowerPoint where I got some quotes from the Rensha book about those two truths, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And we will read them through. So I will ask some of you to read those quotes. And after those quotes are read, I will ask you, the one that has read it, to share with us their idea of how to apply this, what it means for them, those concepts, and invite the other one who wish to share their own understanding and their own way of living that truth, to share it with each other. And I believe in this way, we will enlarge the real brotherhood of men because this is what it's all about. And by accepting our fatherhood of God, so I might come from a different perspective because uh, I try to have a general view of everything. And the concept of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men didn't come to me as such. It took a while for me to grasp this concept. But before I go on with this, I would like to start with a prayer. So I choose the Lord's Prayer which is the, the prayer that we're looking for. So I'm gonna share my screen and what I did, I copy and paste that prayer from the Rensha book, the Lord's Prayer with the exact word that Jesus taught brother and sister. So this is the father of the God and brother of the man. So this is the Lord's Prayer. So maybe you want to say it within your mind with me. So I will tell the prayer, our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our bread for tomorrow. 
refresh our souls with the water of life and forgive us everyone our debts as we also have forgiven our debtor. Save us in temptation, deliver us from evil and increasingly make us perfect like yourself. And please God, I pray that you enlarge our mind to those concepts the concept of you as a father and us as all brother in our mind so we can live this truth in our daily life and make this truth really living on this planet so it can transform the world one individual after another individual. So maybe you will be present in our mind, in all of our actions, in our, all of our intention, and may your will be done. Amen. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. There's an agenda to this uh, presentation. So I want to go through this, uh, this presentation in some kind of order. So first, I'm going to express the goal that I'm looking for in this presentation. I'm going to make a brief introduction. And there's a silver thread of this truth in the wrench of book. It's not only in the fourth part of the book where they talk about the fatherhood of God. It, it talks about it all throughout the book. And then the Lucifer rebellion and the confusion it has created to this truth. To this day about this truth. And then the fatherhood of God, we'll look at that. And then we will also explore the brotherhood of man. And then we will go to the conclusion. And I'm going to change if I can find my, my mouse. For some reason, I cannot find my mouse. No. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, I got it. Okay, the goal of this presentation to explore some of the consequences of the Lucifer's, Luciferian ways of thinking, to realize the importance of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man to find new ways of incorporating and living this doctrine in our life, and to improve the ways in which we express the will of God in our life. And I will start with this quote, the gospel of the kingdom is the fact of the fatherhood of God, coupled with the resultant truth of the sonship brotherhood of men. The persistent preaching of this gospel of the kingdom will someday bring to all nations a new and unbelievable liberation, intellectual freedom, and religious liberty. So I'm going to stop here, stop my sharing. <clears throat> now, I, was, I wanted to make a brief introduction why I'm like why I was so interested in this concept was this truth of the brotherhood of God. Like I said that, and probably was said in the, uh, my bio, I started reading the book in 1999, uh, 1979, sorry. And in 1999, I started my first study group. In the first few years, it took me quite some time uh, before I accepted all the truth contained in Rancho book. And it was far from my mind to think then about the fatherhood of God. When I was thinking about the fatherhood of God, in fact, I didn't have a, a good, how would I say, a, a good reference point. Probably like some of you, I had a father that was very strict, very disciplined, and uh, used a lot of verbal violence to make himself authoritative and obey too. So I had a very strict father. And sometimes, you know, he would slap us on the back of our head just to make his point, you know. So my idea of a father was not like the father that Jesus was telling his apostle about. You know, my father was not that loving kind of father. Of course he loved us and that later on, when I got to know him a little bit better when I became an adult, I understood why 
my father was acting in such ways. It was not because he didn't love me, because it was the only way that he learned how to love and express, you know, his authority through some verbal violence or some minor physical violence. So I had a hard time accepting the concept of God as a loving father. And not only that, being raised as a Catholic, God was always a punishing God. So my concept of God was mostly that, you know, if you do something wrong, well, he will punish you. He didn't give you any good things. He was always giving you, you know, a punishment. And that was coupled with the idea of you go to hell or you go to a purgatory or, you know, you, you never go to heaven. Or if you go to heaven, well, you have to go through a long process of, you know, being treated with violence or, you know, whatever the, the Catholic Church presented. So when I came about with the Rancher book, the, the first part of the book really interested me more than the fourth part of the book. The life of Jesus didn't interest me that much uh, because I had read the Bible before. And so I decided, well, why, why would I be interested in what it says in the Bible? I want to read, you know, other stuff. So for years, my focus was on the third the, the first three parts of the books, not the fourth part. And when I met people, I always talk about the three first part of the book, never about the fourth part of the book. Jesus was out of range for me. And even where I live, you know, if you talk about Jesus, well, they tend to see you as a Jesus freak. So talking about the father of God and the brother of the man was far from my mind. And so the people I got acquainted with or met when I talk about the truth contained in Rancho book, most of those truths that I talk about were far from being accessible to them. And I learned many years later that probably my first few years with the Rancho book, how I was sharing the teaching of the Rancho book was not the good way. A lot of people just turned around and they just wouldn't listen to me or thought I was crazy. And probably some of you also had that same experience. But a few years ago, while I took courses and I took uh, the Christ Experiment courses, there was a focus on the Father of God and the Brotherhood of Man. And then I started reading more about it. And maybe it's because of all those years where I was struggling, you know, uphill to be a better human being. I was looking for ways to improve my life. Maybe this truth of the Father of God and the Brotherhood of Man became more appealing to me. And then I also took course with Musandia. I took course as a section with Jeffrey Wattle who was there. I attended many conferences and all through those courses and conferences, there was always this idea of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men. But my mind was not always open to that truth. It was looking for some, something else, something uh, maybe easier, uh, something more uh, hoping to grasp for my mind because the concept of the father was not a good concept for me at that time. But then, like I say, in the last two, three years after I took the, the course from Christ Experiment and the focus was on that truth, I started realizing and then I decided, I made a decision that every morning, when I do my meditation, because I've been meditating for many years now, every morning and praying, I decided to read the life of Jesus. Every morning I would leave, read at least a good chapter of the life of Jesus, and then meditate on what I was reading. And so far, I guess I've been reading the life and, and teaching of Jesus at least four or five times for the last two, three years. And my comprehension of the example of Jesus, of his teaching, has increased tremendously. But I'm far from where I want to be. So this is why I chose that subject with you guys. So we can share together what we get from this loving truth of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. So let me share with you some other quotes. And then I will ask you to read those quotes. So I won't be able to see the people. So maybe Jeannie, you can tell me 
who's got his hand up, or maybe I can choose a head or whoever wants to read that quote. Yes. So, so I'm gonna, or maybe I can stop sharing my screen at that time. Okay. I'm gonna start sharing. Yep. Oh, it moves to a, okay, let's see this one. So who wants to read that one? You see uh, someone that lifts their hand, Jeannie? Belen. Go ahead, Belen. You're muted, Belen. Okay. The ultimate goal of human progress is the reverent recognition of the fatherhood of God and the loving materialization of the brotherhood of man. So paper 143, 14, page 1608.1. <laughs> so what comes to your mind, Belen, when you read that quote? <clears throat> this is very timely, very highly timely around this time. Although we have to recognize the Father of God and the Brother of Men every day in our life, but what is going on now seems very highly to stick on that and know more about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. So uh, it's very good that we are having this webinar. So, so examples of the daily life to our family, to our uh, relatives, to our neighbors, to our country, to our, uh, to the international community. It, there's so many examples and uh, Urantia, book has really given us examples also and the life of teaching of Jesus Christ while he was here on the planet mm -hmm. yeah so we go I always go back to that personally and meditate on it and try to imbibe it and uh, bring it out from within the happiness within the joy that I have in my heart to my fellows I tried that thank you thank you thank you is there anyone else that believe or had different thought about the ultimate goal of human progress was that recognition of this truth? Or for any of you, is this something new for you? Or was there someone, something more important than to reach that realization? Anyone wants to share their idea? Donna. Yes, um, that concept of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, I think is the most important topic uh, and pursuit that we can have in this time. Um, for me, it's my life's goal is to spend the remainder of my life trying to see how to effect that. Uh, it's the only way that our world will uh, progress toward the golden ages and ultimately to light and life. And so the, the thing for me is always looking for new ways to achieve it and, and to promote it in my personal life and collectively among uh, our Urantian brothers. I think that this is the testing ground to show the world that this can be done. If we can do it with our starting with our group as a as a worldwide example of what a brother real brotherhood can mean, because we've got we've got all the races and we we're in all parts of the world, so this could be a beautiful microcosm to start and then spread out through the entire planet. Thank you, Donna. Monica. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I too, Gaetan, went through the, the Christ experiment. And as I started that, um, I don't want to say I woke up because I always loved Jesus and God. I was brought up in the Catholic Church too, but I was the eldest of six and my mother started teaching me then. And of course, it went downhill after that on account of you can't spend that much time teaching that what you taught your first child with the others. So I am the only Urantia book reader and weird one in the family. So, but when you asked that question, you said, was it always a part of 
you. So when I when I started those courses in the Christ experiment, uh, it's it's like I was brought up to another level. I was awakened to a new level, and 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 uh, became far more active in in my in my spiritual thinking um, and prayer life and worship life. And and what I found in that was how simple Jesus' message was. It isn't doctrine, dogma, and so on and so forth, and, and going here and going there and so on. It's it's me going to the Father. And how simple. I, I mean, if anybody does a search on the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man in the book, it's not going to be once or twice or three times. It's in all parts of the book. Like you said, it's that thread that goes through the whole book. They are consistent. And so, and so I know for some people, fatherhood, the male things, that's a problem. I had an authoritative father too, Italian, French Canadian mother, you know, Catholicism was going to be in the family. Um, so, but, but, but I don't have a problem being a faith son of God, but, um, if in the morning, because you asked daily thing earlier, in the morning, in my prayer time and in my worship time, and then back to my prayer, <laughs> I, 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 I'm asking Father and Father Michael, too, that with their love, which is fatherly, with their love for me, that I may express it outwardly onto those that I will see, be talking to throughout the day, expressing their love in the way they would have me do that, in my time and place. Well, I said enough. Thank you, Gaetan. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, very good point. How do we live that? How do we express that love with others? Yes, Laurent. Paragraph of the Urantia book indicates that the concept of the father is still the most important concept of all. So this is a cornerstone of the whole Urantia revelation. And from an experiential standpoint, if you, we think about the vastness of not only our super universe, but the seven super universes and the whole master universe, and realize that the creator of all this the originator, the one who instituted what we call reality is our father. There's billions, of, there's more inhabited worlds in the universe than there's human beings on this planet currently. And there's billions of people on those worlds. And because of the simple fact that we have, we share the same father, we're all brothers. This is Absolutely fantastic. And the simple, simple fact of stuffing our mind and absorbing ourselves in the reality of the Father, what we call worship, and realizing the greatness of the Father, but also receiving his love, the intensity of the Father's love for each and every one of his creatures. This is a fantastic experience. There's no words capable of describing it. It's beyond the power of words to describe. That's a central reality of the Urantia book. No doubts yeah. about it. Thank you, Karen. It made me think a few things when we were, you were talking about the whole universe, trying to grasp the concept that all of those being, billions of beings are our brothers and sister. I still struggle with that one. And one day when I was thinking about the fatherhood of God, and then I realized, I say, hey, my father is God. I never thought of it that way. I always, God is my father. But then I start thinking about, hey, my father is God. And that, that changed a little bit my perspective of seeing who God was. Then I start seeing God a little bit more like, yeah, God is my father because my father is God. And if God is my father, if, if my father is God, play with the words, 
it changed the way you know I think about it and it changed my concept of it. So let's move on. I want to start exploring something new about where how we were sidestep or sidetrack from that reality of God the Father. So I'm going to share that uh, my screen again. Uh, just a second. Where am I? Now I got two. Okay, I'll try this one. Okay, I'm going to move to this one. I was talking about the consequence of the Lucifer ways of thinking. You might think, why? What that? What has Lucifer has to do with the concept of the Father? Where? Well, there is a quote. Uh, just a second, if I can find my mouse. Okay, here it is. I will read this one. Lucifer contended that the local system should be autonomous. He protested against the right of Michael, the creator's son, to assume sovereignty of Nibadon in the name of the hypothetical paradise fathers and required all personality to acknowledge allegiance to this unseen father. He asserted that the whole plan of worship was a clever scheme to aggrandize the paradise son. He was willing to acknowledge Michael as his creator father, but not as his God and rightful ruler. So right there, Lucifer started to put in the mind of social being and in the mind of others that there was no such thing as God the Father. It was just something that was invented just to further the uh, importance of the paradise son. And then we go on to this other quote. Most bitterly did he attack the right of the ancient of days, foreign potentates, he called them, to interfere in the affairs of the local system and universe. These rulers he denounced as tyrants and other usurpers. He exhorted his followers to believe that none of these rulers could do off to interfere with the operation of a complete home rule. If men and angels only had the courage to assert themselves and boldly claim their rights. Isn't that something, you know? And then on the, another slide. Throughout this period, Kelly Garcia was advocating the cause of Lucifer on the ranch. The Melchizedek ably opposed the apostate planetary prince. But the sophistry of unbridled liberty and the delusion of self-assertion had every opportunity for deceiving the primitive people of a young and undeveloped world. And here are the questions. What comes to your mind when you read these quotes and think about the fatherhood of God? How does that affect the way many perceive the existence of God today? Do you think the Luciferian way of thinking is still influencing the thinking on our world? So I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen. So, you know, when we look at those two quotes, you know, when I was thinking about why is it that it's so hard for people to accept the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man? What, how, how were we sidetracked from that, you know, enlightening truth. How did it started that we got sidetracked? Who was the first conspirator? You know, I always call Lucifer the first conspirator. He's the one that, you know, was the forefather of all those conspirators we see today. Any kind of conspirator, you know, those people that say the church is always manipulating them and all these things. So Lucifer brought to us this, this way of thinking that you know, maybe God the Father doesn't exist at all. It's just an invention of the Creator Son or all those Paradise Son just to gain power over us. And maybe the ancient of days, that's the way they want to rule the world. Maybe it's just a big sham, these things. And some people did believe him. And some people to this day on this planet believe that in some ways or the other. And they reject the idea of the Fatherhood of God. There are religions that reject the idea of God as a father. 
So what do you think about those questions? What comes to your mind when you read these quotes and think about the fatherhood of God? Do you think that uh, it affects our world today? What was proclaimed in those days of the rebellion? And it was another idea? Yes, Don? Yeah, when you put that up, I mean, I've, I've thought about this a long time. And this is the main challenge that makes our work so difficult is because there are many people who would accept the idea of the brotherhood of man but they reject the idea of the fatherhood of God. So that Luciferian influence is very powerful on our world right now. And you can see it, it's threaded throughout all of the political turmoil that we're experiencing right now. Everything is a fight for my uh, personal rights. Any news from Mike and Amy? Pardon me? Oh. So yes, everything is a fight for personal rights and the rejection of uh, a universal father is sown throughout much of our society. And so this is a, when we're, when we're taking a stand to advance the brother, uh, the fatherhood of God, and the brotherhood of man, we are actually having to take a stance against the Lucifer Manifesto. If, you, if we look at that Lucifer Manifesto, we can see that that ideology is sown in the minds of so many people today. And so we've got a battle. This, uh, I like the slide you put up where uh, Lucifer said, boldly claim your rights. Uh, and this illusion, it's, it's described as an illusion of self-assertion that people want. And the only way to conquer it, my goodness, is for us to stick firmly to this concept, this ideal, and use the beauty of it to help to put down the, the ideology the same way that Gabriel had to do when he took his stand uh, on the father's world and he was refuting the whole Lucifer concept and people were going back and forth to listen to Lucifer and then to listen to Gabriel. Uh, we've got to take that position like, like Gabriel did and fight for this concept and do everything we can to, to show how foolish and illusory this Luciferian concept is. Thank you, Donna. Well, you might think why I chose again those quotes, you know, because even today when we're trying to live that truth in our life and share that truth, we, we, we meet with maybe with some resistance, even among our family, even among the religion we might be practicing, still practicing, we're still going to some churches. People are, you know, they might know about the concept about this truth of the fatherhood and the brotherhood. Intellectually, they might accept it, but do they live it? Do they accept it in their daily life? And this is what we have to go through now today when we, we became reader of the Rencha book and we want to, to be part of that plan to make this revelation become really living on this world. This is what we go against. We go against that, that way of thinking. So go ahead, Sherry. Sherry, that's how you yeah. say your name. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So here's a thought. Here's a thought. Um, most people on this planet have been raised by human parents and have been very wounded by human parenting. And I'm making a very generic statement here. But I myself, a few years ago, when I began reading the book and uh, being mentored in the Urantia material, I had this meltdown one day where I realized I can't trust God to be my father because my earth father, my mortal father, died when I was five, abandoned me, 
And why wouldn't, I, I, I'm not going to trust God the Father. No way, Jose. <laughs> because just when I love him and just when I give myself and my heart and my soul, to, he's going he's to be out of He's going to abandon me. I'm 65 years old, folks. I've been working on this a long time. <laughs> so having said that, though, the thought as we're talking about this, this topic occurred to me, perhaps one of the things we need to do is to re-educate ourselves and others about, about God, about our Father God, which really has often very little to do with our mortal parenting. And it just occurred to me that the concept of, of, of a sovereign father uh, is often related to, you know, people have the thought of a parent, a father. Well, I don't have a very good relationship with parenting, so how can I trust this, this immortal, eternal father to, to really, truly love me, want my highest good, want to offer me and pour the grace and all the help that I could possibly need? And uh, I, I almost think it's a reorientation, a redefinition, a re-education of the father that we are talking about here and away from mortal parenting, which so many people have are stuck with. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you bring a good point. And that's what I was talking about at the beginning. And one of the way that I've found to reestablish the good picture of a father for me was to read through the life of Jesus and look at how Jesus lived his life because he was the father personification when he lived there. So I'm focusing more now on the way he loved the people around him, how we express that love, how we live his life. And I always saying myself, that's the father. He, he's the father. And that, that helped me a lot in acquiring that new concept of a loving father that my father could not give me. And I still struggle with that. I agree. But I'm moving on. You know, it, it truly helped me move forward with seeing God as a loving father. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, Belen, you want to share something and then groups. Yeah, that, that's really true. All the comments are really very helpful. Um, to me, the Lucifer Rebellion has to be restarted. Education is what Sherry was saying. It has to be, education has to be realigned, to be re-evaluated because of our heritage, origin, our history. So much has to be, uh, to be known and be able to absorb what are the lessons that we learned from the origin and our history and our destiny. And uh, Lucifer Rebellion is uh, one of those things that really give us, in my own study, I, it was through my own study also and with the help of others that I come to realize how uh, the bad effect in humanity, this Lucifer Rebellion, this unbridled liberty and autonomous and all that kind of, he was declaring. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Belen. Bruce. Uh, yeah, thanks, first of all, for doing this and bringing this subject up, because it's pretty much what the Ranch book is, is the brotherhood of God and fatherhood of man, which is really good. And bringing Lucifer into this, it's interesting. And then our own experiences with our own fathers, um, because your father, whether you had a good experience or not, gave you life, just as our God, the father, gave us life. And the one gift that uh, Lucifer I mean, didn't quite get was, or did get was that he also gives you free will. And Lucifer abused free will, which is his right because, he, because God gave him this gift, just like we all have this gift. And, you know, to me, there's only, there's two things that, that prove that there is a God, you know, a lot of people talk about that. One is that you have free will. Who, who gave that to you? The other one is gravity. That's the obvious one. But I think that when, when all this came down with Lucifer and there was only two other rebellions like this in Nebadon, that that's why they said, okay, they treated it totally different than they did the first two. 
And we kind of got stuck in that also because, and they're pretty clear about this, they wanted to let it play out. And they felt, and they decided in the long run, that's better than to just come in and, you know, everybody's extinct or whatever you do. So anyway, I think that, that so then that's the beauty of God and, you know, God the Father, and, and we all have that God. Um, and if he wasn't in the center holding gravity, everything would be disarray. So, you know, the beauty of the Urantia book is all those beautiful things. So thanks to everybody, and I appreciate you all. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah. Rebellion has caused us many problems. And sometimes people might ask, you know, if God as a father is a loving father, why does he let all that bad things happen to us? And just yesterday, I was uh, watching a movie they're talking about the Holocaust. And there was a, a survivor from the Holocaust. And he says, you know, he was a priest, in fact, that was incarcerated, but he was a, a Jewish guy who got incarcerated. And he says, I believe in God before, but when I saw what was happening in that camp, that death camp, I stopped believing in God. And, I, and in my mind, I was thinking, how many others are just like him today? When they see all the wrong going on hurt, they say, well, if there's such a loving God, I don't believe he exists because of all the wrong that's, that's happening in the world. And I think this is because we have a wrong concept of God. We don't know who really God is. And this is the job that we need to do. This is our mission to portray that God to the rest of the world by establishing the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man and living as Jesus lived his life. Now, I mentioned before that I would show you a silver thread of that truth throughout the book. So I will share my screen and then I'll, I will go to some quotes. I think that's the one. Okay, you see that one. And there's two people that live there and I will come back to you. So there are 67 mentions of God the Father in the whole book. That's an English book. Uh, I, I just put those words in bracket. There are 10 mentions of the fatherhood of God in the three first part of the book. There are 33 mentions of the fatherhood of God in the fourth part of the book. There are 1,000 mentions of the word father in the whole book. There are 217 mentions of the brotherhood in the whole book, 86 of them in the three first part. <clears throat> there are 20 mentions of the brotherhood of men in the fourth part of the book. There are 34 mentions of the sonship with God in all the different parts of the book. There are 139 mentions of the word sonship with God in all different parts of the book. I think it's the same word, uh, same as before, <clears throat> but <clears throat> just in the, the whole book. So I'm going to go to the uh, to the other quote about the, the fatherhood of God. So anyone wants to read the, this one? Jeannie, you, you're still there? Yes, I am here. You see anyone that's... Uh... I am looking for someone. We have two hands raised, but I don't know if they want Eugene, to read. Eugene, Eugene, Eugene. <clears throat> Who wants to read? Yeah, I, I, I can make comments, but I can read this too. Okay. Want me to read? Yes. Read first, right? Read Fatherhood first. Fatherhood of God in all his personal relations with the creature personalities of the universes, the first source and sender is always and consistently a loving father. God is a father in the highest sense of the term. He is eternally motivated by the perfect idealism of divine love. And that tender nature finds its strongest expression and greatest satisfaction in loving and being loved. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. 
So we're going to go to another one. Another one. Someone else want to read these two quotes? I will. Good. Will. Go ahead. The fatherhood of God. Jesus proclaimed the good news of knowing God and yourself as a son of God. These differing concepts of the purpose of religion determine the individual's attitude in various life situations and foreshadow the depth of worship and the nature of his personal habit of prayer. Always, the burden of his message was the fact of the Heavenly Father's love and the truth of his mercy, coupled with the good news that man is a faith son of this same God of love. Thank you. So, <clears throat> I know there are two people that live there, and maybe uh, I'm going to come back to them just to, to go on those two last quotes and, and the one before. Sonship with God. That's another way of looking at the fatherhood of God. We are the son of that, that father, of that God. And I was wondering why did they talk about the fatherhood, then they talk about the sonship and all this. It's like this, it seems like the same thing, but conceptually, in, in our mind, it differs. It, it, changed, it changed the concept, it, it changed something in our mind. Now, it says here this different concept of the purpose of religion determine the individual attitudes in various life situations and foreshadow the depth of worship and the nature of his personal habits of prayer. How does that affect you in your prayer in your life? When you think about, hey, I'm the son of God, well, what does that do to you in your relationship with everyone else? How do you acquire that profound belief as a way of living? So I'm gonna start because Eugene lifted life, uh, lift his hand, sorry. You want, you want to say something, Eugene? Uh... First of all, um, I um, I uh, I would like to comment also on why the the first example why people doesn't believe in God, you know, because of their uh, bad experiences, you know. Yeah. Uh, from my understanding, um, God gave us free will, and the uh, paradise and central universe was the creation of God the Father and God the Son and the Spirit, right? But when it comes to our evolutionary universe, what's happening is that the Trinity, of course, working with the Supreme Being is working. And my understanding is that it does it through righteousness. That means you have to be bal balanced and just in this evolutionary world. So whatever we do here, because of the imbalances and um, we might call evil too, if it becomes imbalanced, um, we will get that, the law of cause and effect too. So um, the Trinity doesn't care. It doesn't, you know, no respect or a person, right? God does, is not a respect or a person. So, uh, whatever is the collective consciousness, let's say, during that time, during the Ger Germany, we're in, you know, the, uh, the negative mind consciousness was instigated by Hitler. So he was able to mobilize all these German people against the Jews, you know. It doesn't necessarily mean that the Jews doesn't also create some of it, right? Because there's a law of cause and effect. So, but it, it goes really too far. Uh, and that's what happened. And uh, basically, the way I look at it is that it is a good lesson for us, you know, because every negative thing is also a good lesson as much as good things. So, uh, so hopefully, we learn from that, and we don't do that again. And uh, another good example of this is, why is, let's say, China... Uh, from my understanding, they, they at least I think this in a, a Urantia book, they already went through a lot of wars during the, the different kingdoms fighting each other. And what happened, they saw the problem of war. And so they become a little bit more peaceful 
compared to other nationalities, okay? So um, the thing is this, what's, what works, what the God the Father works within us, okay? So people who are aware, who are enlightened, should be able to do, to uh, balance or to do justice, to be righteous, to give example to whatever imbalances or injustice or unrighteousness that is here on earth. That's very important. That's all I have to say on, on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back to that question that I've asked about the first quote there that Jesus proclaimed the good news of knowing God in yourself as a son of God. How does that change your attitude in different life situations? Have you noticed that by accepting that fact that you're a son of God has changed your way of interacting with others, about your ways of praying, about your ways of worship? Has that help, is, that, is that true? Does it help you evolve spiritually? Does it that resolve some conflict within you? Yes, Alfonso? You're mute. Sorry. Yeah. Not anymore. Uh, um, hi, everybody. And I'm very happy to be here. And um, in my experience, uh, about uh, God as a father, it's, it's just, uh, uh, well, first I have to say that, like in your experience, and my experience was similar to your, a very father, a um, very strict father, you know, but uh, maybe that I didn't have that, that connection with my father, uh, my physical father. I, I look for the, to have one with God, you know, from very early age, you know, I was 13, 15 years old, and I always prayed to him. I thought I was talking to him very early in my age, you know, and, uh, and for me right now is, it's like a, I trust in him. I, I know for sure that he is. He's a loving and caring father. And and for me, for us is to recognize that consciously that he is a father to us and for us, you know, and carry on with, 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 that, with that trust, with that simple trust of like he's holding your hand, you know, and he's with you all the time. So that's that's part of what uh, my experience, knowing and accepting that God is as my father, as a loving and caring father. So that that's give you like a impulse, strength, you know, within you to carry on, to keep going. So for me, that 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 is that is my experience. That hey, I know that is that God is as, my, as our father, and and. Uh, it's a good thing that I know, but uh, how to put it on, on on other people's mind, you know, how to transmit that message to others. That's what I I have to find out, you know, in the practice, you know. But that's for me. That's what it is, you know. A trust that always with me. That is in us. It is with us, mm -hmm. and carry on, you know. That's that's what gives me me a trust and confidence, you know, and and joy. More than nothing. That's Thank all I have to say. Thank you, Alfonso. Thank you. Uh, there was Jeffrey, but Jeffrey, there's David, and there's Sherry, and then I'll come back to you, Jeffrey. Okay, go ahead, David. Uh, one of the things uh, that really impressed me in reading the Arantia book was there comment about how we mortals solve our problems. They tell us that it would be very helpful for us if we did top-down problem solving. We as mortals tend to look at everything that we do around us and try to solve it on this level and that how much more helpful it would be for us to start from the top down and I realized, you know, that's actually how the Arantia book is 
is actually put together. It's put together on a top down. They start with the fatherhood of God, and then they work down. The last section of the book is the teachings of Jesus. That's so I'm always impressed at how simple Jesus put it. And, you know, we've got 2,097 pages of instruction in the Urantia book. And Jesus could pare it down to one sentence, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Now, look what he does when he says that. That's a top-down solution to everything. You're going right to the first source and center, the fatherhood of God. And the brotherhood of man, that's us mortals, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that and understanding how important effective prayer is. And I'm not going to go into what effective prayer is because they talk about the Raja book talks a lot about what effective prayer is, <clears throat> but it's worship. It's prayer and worship and um, having contact with your creator. Well, that does a lot to be able to solve all, all your problems um, or at least get a handle on what the problems are and how to deal with them. Uh, so I, I just thought I'd point that out. Uh, uh, and. Uh, Another issue here is with uh, the Lucifer. Uh, when I first read about the Lucifer Manifesto, I was stunned. I mean, we didn't really have much in the way of an understanding of what, what went on. The record that we have was that the devil wanted to, he claimed he was God. And that was pretty much it. But when you read that manifesto, it's just, it's just unbelievable, which it makes you wonder how in the world so many seraphim and so many of the other spiritual uh, uh, spirit beings actually fell for that nonsense when you actually read the manifesto. It's just unbelievable. And it took seven years before anybody really stepped in. So um, anyway, yeah, I just wanted to throw that out. It's just how simple Jesus made it, the fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man. That really encompasses all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. When you were talking about prayers, of course, there are many ways of praying. Uh, but for me, that has changed the way that I meet God uh, when I think about him as a father. And that made me, made it a habit of meeting with God, my father, every day, just like would be my real father, you know, like, like when we're kids, we always have our father present with us. Every day we meet our father. And if our father goes away for some, some time, we, we worry, where is he? You know, is something bad happened to him? But if we meet with God every day, and we, I think we, when we, we, we know that concept of the father of God, we need to make a rendezvous with our father every day. We need to sit down, and have a talk with him and try to listen to what might comes up in our mind. So the, this is my impression about this quote. Okay, Sherry, and then we'll go to Jeff. Yes, thank you so much. I just wanted to very simply say in response to the question, how has this changed things for me? It is uh, the more I uh, identify the more, the deeper that I identify as um, a, a daughter of God, I want to raise my standards. I want to raise my own standards of living, my own standards of relating. It's just, and, and, and rather than doing it from a you're supposed to, or this bad thing is going to happen to you, which is very often what the church dogma teaches us, it's a desire that wells up from within. It's like, no, it, it, it brings me joy to raise my standards. It's a challenge I look forward to taking on, even when I fall short and fail. I know that I, I know that I'm being cheered on by my father, who's saying it doesn't matter that you you it doesn't matter that you stumble and fall. Just the fact that you desire it is what I'm looking for, and that gives me so much more joy and pleasure to want to raise my standards. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Oh, thank, you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, thank, thank you for sharing that, you know, raising our standard. I remember my, even myself when I 
when I'm about to make a decision, and I know that decision might, uh, you know, go either way, like improve or, you know, just think about myself. I'm thinking, hey, I, I'm the son of God. How should I act? And that changed completely the way I look at things. And sometimes what I wanted to do, I just don't do it, you know, or I do it differently. So there, there's some real good truth in all this, you know. It's when we ask that question, hey, I'm the son of God. Should I act that way? What could I do? You know, how should I act? And then to give us a higher perspective. And I think when we do this, the part of God within us express what we should be doing or how we should live our life in some ways, respecting our free will also. Okay, Pablo. Oh, uh, there was Jeff before Pablo. I'll come back to you. Jeff, go ahead. For the moment, I'll just be very brief. I want to say that the thinking of myself as a son of God, that um, that gives a dignity that cannot be derived from this world and its interactions. And it, it brings one into the primary relationship and, and one is relating as soul. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to say something else or were you done, Jeffrey? Done for now. Okay, thank you. Good comments. And of course, when we think about being the son of God, it, it dignify who we are. It, it trays who we are, it trays our dignity and how we look at ourselves. So I think we need to repeat that to ourselves. Hey, I'm son of God. I'm the son of God. I'm the son of God. And see how that changed our way of doing and thinking about things. Okay, Pablo, go ahead. Thank you, Gadan. You know, when I was a, a child, I went to a, a farm far away from my home. And somebody was, was, uh, was visiting us from the United States. And this person uh, in the farm, the little kid there, his father was doing a, a, a construction. Um, so the, the, our friends from New York, he said, oh, you know, in, in my city, there is a, a big building that have more than 100 uh, floors. And, and, the, and the child from the, from the farm said, that's impossible. I don't believe that, that's impossible. And he said, why? Because my father and my uncle, they has been years building this and they, and they can, cannot do it yet, no? So something, 100 floors and, and about it is impossible. I don't believe it. So I, I, I laugh a lot and I, and I have a book in, in that moment in, in the, my father's car. So I bring the book from history and I show him picture from, uh, from the pyramids in, in, Egypt, in Egypt. And he said, what in this world doing Thousands of years ago, that's impossible. I don't believe it. That's lies. No, because we tend to, to think within our frame, no, in, within our frame of mind and experiences and everything. So that happened to Lucifer. Lucifer is just a little above ourselves in divinity. Okay. He hasn't been in paradise. He hasn't met the father, but he doesn't believe him because he hasn't experienced it between, within himself. As, uh, that's the first thing that I think when we, when you say uh, we are son of God. First, we have to experience it in ourselves. Okay, first, first of all. So why the, the, the revelation of Jesus was important when he said, God the Father loved each one of us and, and, all, and, and all of us. Because that make us make think how he loved us. For example, the, the grand the revelation say that once we make our first moral decision, the adjuster came. It's a gift from the Father. And that gift is the first show, in my, in my opinion, of love. Why? Because once we are born in, in this planet, for example, we are conditioned to material things. We will die. We will die. So once we think right and make the moral decision, God, our Father, say, okay, to this son, I will give him this gift. And the first gift is the salvation. is the possibility to be futuro eternal and to meet him. He loves us so much that he, he gives us everything. He say, okay, I want that you, the imperfect 
my imperfect son that is just making his first steps in, in the world, come to me and be perfect as I am perfect. That is another show of love. So once we realize that we are son of God, and then we think, okay, so that person is also son of God, that person is sister of God. So our family is every day growing up and it's very difficult process. It's a very difficult process for me, for example, when I meet somebody, a, a new person, and I interact with that person and I say, that person is also a son of God or a sister of God. So it's my brother, it's my sister, and I have to make something to comprehend this person, to love his person, to know his need, to try to help. And that is a very difficult challenge in our life. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A different perspective, a higher perspective of what is a son of God. It gave us an insight on the potential that is within us as a son of God. In fact, they say with God, there's nothing impossible. The impossible can be accomplished if we have faith in it. Thank you. Okay, Monica, and then we go to a few quotes. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Gaetan, for doing this and, and, and because it's brought out so many wonderful personal experiences. And I see it as God expressing himself through each and every one who has had a chance to talk. And I've already spoken. Thank you for letting me talk. Um, uh, several things, and you said, "What did you? What did you just say? Um, what did you just say, Gaetan? The last thing before you invited me. Oh, the Son of God. I think that's it. I see myself as a faith Son of God. My gender means nothing because I see. Uh, they, uh, they tell us that um, uh, the children of the um, the Father and the Son are sons, and the um, Infinite Spirit has daughters. So I see myself as a son. I see myself as heir to all that He uh, promises us. Um, uh, the divine pause. That's where I need to, like uh, Pablo was saying, you know, and being able to comprehend. Oh, gosh, did I get that a few weeks ago? Understanding my brother or sister is so important and, and allowing judgment. Who am I to judge? You know, where somebody is coming from. I am their sister. And I choose to behave that way. Let them choose how they respond or react. But it's my responsibility to be their sister in this time and place. I love, Sherry, hearing you say my father. Because I started to say that in the last year and a half and my father. And it truly shows a relationship that we personally have. We know he's our father. Um, and, and to respond, uh, the, the prayer and the worship part, and I just got worship. I've been, I've had this for 35 years. Embarrassingly, I've only read it once, but in the last year, I, I read it through again, in paper by paper. But uh, in the last year and a half, I finally got the concept of worship. And so it was in a course because I think I always thought that worship was in the church and singing together and, and so on and so forth, because that's that's how I was how I was groomed. Um, and and it was in a course and, and the teacher was a therapist and he was saying how one of his client patients was in a world of hurt and not a believer and this, that and the other thing. And he gave him some contemplation techniques really it was worship but he didn't say that to him so after a week he came back to the next appointment he said I don't know what happened but I am staying with that practice and the fellow became a Urantia book reader and is doing well today so I, I wrote the instructor and I said I want to know what you told him and so he did and um, contemplative prayer and whatever you want to call it spending time with the father half an hour in the morning half an hour at night time so i did it at night time quietly i did it in the morning and i'm not telling my husband or anything like that this is my business anyway i go out it's a beautiful day and i'm going to mow the lawn we have acres and i started bit by bit and i said oh, i'll do that part i'll do that part anyway i ran out of gas so i came to get and i said i, I ran out of gas i had a minute left to do and so he said congratulations and I said um, well I didn't intend to do the whole thing I was just he said oh I'm not talking about the lawn 
I'm talking about you making the circle of worship. And I said, well, how do you know that? Because I hadn't shared that I was going to take this on. He said, well, can't you see the light? And so I said, I don't see anything. I don't hear anything. But what I did notice and have ever since is um, um, a, a, a more staid character, a more guided in my words, in my actions, less intolerance for silly things. And I don't hear voices and I don't feel it. It just seems to work itself out. So I encourage because I just learned this. <laughs> so when you just learn something, you want to turn around. And eat. Yeah. But I presume everybody else <laughs> knows this from way back. I, 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 my prayer time, I, I include my whole spirit team. I start with my father, Michael, brother, Jesus. I go to mother and my seraphim. I go to my beloved father fragment, my BFF, and I end up with father, dad, and worship. And then I go back to talking to him for the rest of the day. Yeah. And it Thank has you. made a big <clears throat> influence in my life. Yeah. Thank you, Monica. We have to go to others. Thank you for your sharing. Thank you. Uh, Karat, and then we'll go to our quotes, and then we'll we'll move on to the Brotherhood of Man after that. Okay. Um, first thing to consider when we think about the concept of the universal father is that he's a person. We're not dealing with a force like electricity that we could manipulate at our will, but we're dealing with a person with whom we can relate. And uh, I remember my own own father. He never imposed his religious belief upon me, but every morning he went to church. During my whole life, I noticed that every day, every morning, my father was at church in the morning. He started this day that way. That impressed me a heck of a lot. And also realizing that my father was addressing himself to our father, to our universal father. So the concept of father is father is more than a concept. He is the central person in our lives. When we know him, he lives within us while he's also at the center of everything. He um, brings us comfort. Uh, we're never alone because he's always with us. He's closer to us than the marrow of our own bones. He knows us more than we know ourselves. And he can guide us as we explore in life, uh, beauties, goodness, and truth, and integrate those values in our lives. He is there within us, guiding us and vetting all of our discoveries, turning what we are, are the gems, the treasures that we discover in life into imperishable gems within our souls. He is building us, transforming us. Life is a constant communion relation with him. The moment we know him, we, we can't turn back. It's, it's a partnership. God is our greatest partner yeah. and a loving partner. Yes. Thank you, Kanad. It made me think that uh, <clears throat> when I was thinking about God the Father, like you say, he gave us everything. And when I think about him, he, he does give us everything. And then when I, when I really meditate on that fact that we live in the Father, he is within us. He gave us everything. In fact, he gave us our personality, gave us the thought adjuster. The son is from the father. The spirit is from the father. So what is left of me? That's what the question I was asking. What is left of me that really is me? And by going back to the ranch book, the only thing I could find, my will. That's the only thing that truly belongs to me, that he gave me. That's, it's to me, that's the only thing I can give back to God. I can give him my will to do his will. Nothing else. I cannot say to God, I'm giving you that, I'm going to give it. He got all, he's got everything. Everything that I can give him, he already has created for me. So there's nothing I can give him than the will to do his will. And that, that comes as a prayer every day that you will be done. 
that my will be your will. And then I play around with this concept of doing the will of the Father. And integrating what you just said, those three big values, the three, the true beauty and goodness in my life. And asking myself every time, when I do this, is this true? Is this the best that I can do? Is this good? Is this, is it, is it beautiful? The action that I'm causing. So there's many ways of looking at this and exploring our sonship with God. So I'm going to share that uh, a few other quotes, and then we'll move on to the brotherhood of men. I want to explore more about the brotherhood of men. So I'm going to finish with the, the fatherhood, and I'm going to share with you this one. If different religions recognize the spirit's sovereignty of God the Father, then will all such religions remain at peace. Only when God the Father becomes supreme will man become religious brother and live together in religious peace on earth. We are indeed his loyal subject, but far transcending that fact is the transforming truth that we are his sons. And then, of course, I've got many other quotes, but uh, there's, there won't be time to explore all of them. So I had a few questions, but uh, I'll stop sharing. If what the Rensha book says that the Father of God, and when it's accepted by our religion, we will have peace, doesn't that tell, tell us what we should be striving to accomplish, to share with all other religion, the truth about God, that he is our father and we all brother. You know, when I start thinking about this concept about how can we accomplish this in the world? How can we bring the whole world to accept that truth? We're far from there. You know, if you look at the world, we're far from there with all the wars we have, with all the religious war we have. You just think about the Taliban now in Afghanistan and you think, you know, these people, do you think they truly believe that God is their father and that we're all brother and sister? So imagine the, 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 the road ahead of us. So us as a wretchable creator, how do we go about to share that truth? How do we do that? Or do we just go about and want to give the book to everyone? Like uh, you know, some of us used to do. I, I did that before, it didn't work. So how do we proclaim that truth? How do we live that truth? How do we share that truth? How do we make something lively, something accessible to every religion? So anyone has any idea about this? How do you do it? Anyone has tried to do that? Yes, Jeff, go ahead. And then we'll go to Baxter and Doreen. Uh, I, I do so many things for so long. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't say all of them, but I've, I've done a number of writings in, for academic purposes, helping people to understand that the fatherhood of God is is uh, not a bottom-up projection, but a, a top-down revelation. Um, I also find that the, the critique of the father concept of God as being sexist is so pervasive that I often say something like this. I, I talk about the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of, of man, the equality of women with men, and the freedom of each person to use the language that expresses their experience of the friend whose spirit lives within. And when I talk about the, the, the spirit within and the and friendship with God, uh, that seems to balance things out uh, for some people in a, in, in a way that allows them to hear what... Uh, you know, you don't have to have a bad father to to just be drenched by all the propaganda 
uh, about sexism. So those are some of my approaches. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, we, we hear that the, the sexism trying to not to say God is our father, but God is our mother. But it says in Rachel book someplace that the son represent the mother. That, and even the supreme is like our mother. So there, there's a concept of, of mother and father, but God as such is the father. And there's a good reason for that concept because of, because of us. So Baxter, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, it seems to me that the, the concept of the oneness of God and the, uh, the brotherhood of man hits a concrete wall until, unless and until we as individuals and as the human race, um, until we resolve the, the, the blinding, uh, the, the, the veil of religious sanctimony, which, which proclaims that anyone who doesn't believe as I do is wrong. It's easy to, to reject those like, like the Taliban. I mean, no way would, would, any, would I want to justify the evils that, that are done by people who uh, claim belief in Muhammad. But uh, while not justifying that or, or excusing it, you can't just reject everyone who isn't a Christian. Um, because part and parcel of the oneness of God is the oneness of his representation on earth. Um, the spirit of Jesus, it strikes me, it's made very clear in the Rancher book and every religion that God has always been with us. God has always represented himself to us. The, the spirit of Christ, um, I think it's hubris to think that, that Christ is limited only to one expression. Christ has expressed himself to us all through human history by different names. He expressed himself through Moses. He expressed himself through Buddha. He expressed himself through, through Christ. He expressed himself through Muhammad. These are all the expressions of the same spirit. And we can't reject any of these cultures because they don't use the word Jesus. This is all the same spirit. I hear Christians saying, well, or, or non-Christians say, well, why doesn't Jesus talk more about meditation? Well, why would he? He already told us all of that when he, when he spoke to us as, as Buddha. You know, you don't have to repeat yourself. You're, you're God, you know. And not only that, but it is not for us to differentiate between um, the, God express, speaking through one person, personage, and God speaking through another personage. First of all, those two personages may be unique, but the, the spirit that animates them is the manifestation of God. That's Christ, the Christ spirit. So whether he speaks as Muhammad or as Buddha or as Christ, it is the Christ spirit speaking. And it's not for us to differentiate between them. And until we resolve that hubris and, and forget about rejecting other people because they don't use the word Jesus when speaking when referring to the manifestation of God, we're never going to achieve brotherhood of man, or we're never going to really get a concept of the oneness of God and the oneness of religion. There really is only one religion. And uh, you can give it whatever name you want. It's been expressed throughout human history in different ways. Anyway, that, you, you get my point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maxon. Good points you bring up. The oneness of God in all its expression throughout human and humanity. Thank you. Doreen, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, Gaetan. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, exercise. Now, what I wanted to say, I had gone to several of uh, uh, the religions of uh, the Parliament of World Religions, and there they did express there is, there is a commonality between all religions. You see, it's not in the lower part of it, you know, the cultural things and what they eat and what they drink and how they, it is, like you said with the Arantia book, you start from the top. What is the common ethic and moral we all could agree on with the one God? And they can, and they said they can, and they will get together even with people that don't agree, 
you know, with religion altogether. But there is that top, that top uh, recognition that God is certain things. God is love. They could all agree on that, you see? And so you have to work not from the things that we don't agree with, the, the things we don't have in common, it's what do we all have in common? Mm -hmm. And for someday they'll get there, but it was really a good effort. And there are books on it. And I remember Hans Kung, he was a wonderful, wrote a wonderful book on New World Ethic years and years ago. And so he described it beautifully how to understand how the world can really come together. And so we can't focus on, our, just like your rancher readers, as if to say everybody agrees with each other. That's absolute nonsense. I, you know, we're so individualistic, we're so unique as God has created us. It's what do we have that we could all agree on and come together and learn to love each other and same with religion. Without love, you have nothing. So anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Doreen. You, you bring a good point. What we have in common, and not try to focus on what we don't have in common. If you start a conversation by pointing out what's not common among us, then you're going to have uh, quite a discussion, more an argument. But if you go on commonality, then you're sure to reach the other person's heart. And love is a good place to start. Thank you. Yes, Conrad, you have your hands up. Well, when we talk about the Father of God, it's important to keep in mind that when we say Father, this is the part of God that we can experience. There's more to it than what we can experience because our experience of God will grow in eternally but the part of god that we experience is something that we can share and the only way to prove for a human being to prove to another human being the experience of god is to do, to relate to this experiential dimension of god so what we live with our father is something that we can share with our fellow brothers and sisters. And that's not only the source, the Father of God is not only the source of, of the brotherhood uh, of uh, humanities and all personalities, but the fatherhood of God is a reality through which we can share our Father. And, and it gives us this possibility to convey the reality of the universe Father to our brothers and sisters and to receive and to be enriched by their own experience of the father. Uh, and uh, also uh, when we talk about the fact that we use the word father rather than mother, uh, yes, you mentioned that the, the supreme being is referred to as the universal mother, uh, sometimes the eternal son, but the concept of father is related to primacy. It means that there's none before him. That's why we call him father. But it conveys the concept that we're dealing with a personality. He's not a, just a force. He's a person. And our brothers and sisters are person. So it's a family. It, 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 it develops the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man develops a sense of family. Uh, and... and uh, it is always true that the concept, the, the word father is never imposed. In the Arantia book, when they talk about the name of God in uh, the paper number one, uh, second section, they indicate that God never imposes a form of arbitrary uh, um, worship or that never uh, present himself by name. Name calling him a father is our own choice. It, it's related to our experience of his reality. Mm -hmm. um, he is the father of all, of all good things. Uh, sometimes in other uh, religions, for instance, a Muslim, there's a hundred names referring to God, but among those one hundred names, and there are no primitive. Some of those names are very, very inspiring and very. 
uh, rich and, and it demonstrate a, a depth of spirituality. But there's two missing names, father and love. And the, to me, these are extremely important. Uh, their concept, the reason why they, they reject the concept of God is because to them, it seems to indicate that we are in the image of God as a human being. And so God would be like a man. It's an anthropomorphic concept to those guys. But the moment you say universal father, then you de-anthropomorphize the concept of the father. The father as an absolute being and as an absolute personality. And the moment they, they open up to this concept, their resistance to the concept of God will fall apart. And I'm very confident about that. It's a matter of time. Thank you. That becomes very attractive the moment you live it. Yeah. Thank you, Karan. The universality of personality. You know, the God is absolute personality. I always thought about that. What, what exactly does that mean? Who, who is God? He's more than a father, but he's many more things. And its expression in the universe, probably I was thinking also on other planets well advanced, do they call him the father or do they have another name for him? They say in the Rensha book, the concept of father is the highest concept we can achieve of God at this time. But maybe in our evolution, we'll have a different concept of God as an expression of love, relationship, and whatever. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, Don, go ahead, and then Barbara. Yeah, so uh, I want to preface my statement with, um, so you, you asked, how do we proclaim this fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man to people uh, so that we can build a brotherhood? And uh, I think a few people stated quite well that um, we can't pound people over the head with this is a way or that's the way, and they need to uh, be allowed to envision the father that's compatible with their personality and so forth. Uh, but having said that, there are some things that um, we can do, uh, which I think could be really helpful. First of all, uh, what is the community of influence that we have? And uh, also, are there things that we can do to enhance people's concept of Jesus. I think Jesus figures uh, at a very central part of our advancing the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Uh, sometimes I, I hear comments that, you know, it's almost as if we should mention Jesus or that uh, Jesus is a, a lightning rod. And if you bring up the name of Jesus, then people are gonna consider you a Jesus freak. So there's a fear about mentioning him. And um, I find that people of other religions don't have that problem. Uh, the Buddhists certainly don't have a problem with mentioning, you know, how they revere Buddha. And people of other traditions don't have a problem with uh, talking about, uh, you know, who the leader or guru or, or deity of their religion that they follow. So we shouldn't have uh, any fear of uh, mentioning Jesus, but what we have to do is not assume the way many Christians have done it. And that is demanding that unless you approach God in the name of Jesus, you're doomed. Now the Midwayers make a, a beautiful comment here about this in paper 196. They say the time is ripe to witness the figurative resurrection of the human Jesus from his burial tomb amid the theological traditions and the religious dogmas of 19 centuries. Jesus of Nazareth must no longer be no, be no longer sacrificed to even the splendid concept of the glorious glorified Christ. What a transcendent service if through this revelation the son of man should be recovered from the tomb of traditional theology and pre be presented as the living Jesus to the church that bears his name 
and to all other religions. So that's the challenge for us. We, we can't shy away from the beauty of the master and the things that he taught. We, we want to become skillful in avoiding that reputation that many have of, uh, of becoming like a Jesus freak, so to speak. And when I think of that term, that's a person who is closed-minded. They don't have a, a big concept of the master that we do have from four. And you can't tolerate someone's uh, alternative views about the master. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Um, my wife and I see a lady who is a uh, Tibetan doctor. So she, um, she uses Tibetan me medicine to examine and heal. And uh, so she, in our last visit, she was mentioning to us that how devoted she is to this guru. I think they call him Rinpoche or Ripoche, something along that. And she was saving money so that she could go back uh, to an area of India and erect a monument. Now, this woman is, is, she gives a lot to healing people and often does a lot of free work. And I, I commended her for her beauty and uh, also for her devotion. But as we mentioned that, I say, you know, well, um, my wife and I, we have a great love and devotion to Jesus of Nazareth. And, uh, but I didn't make it a point of contention. And the woman came forth and she says, yes, Jesus is a beautiful person too. And, and I have a high regard for him. So, I've learned that you don't try to pit Jesus against someone else. But at the same time, we can acknowledge him. And also skillfully, whenever we have an opportunity to show the beauty of the master. And I think we can do that because as you read part four, Jesus, uh, before he began his ministry with the apostles, encountered people of all backgrounds. When he was in Greece, uh, he, you know, we learned that he encountered uh, uh, Greek philosophers, Jewish religionists, people from foreign countries, and everyone he came in contact with, many of those who had the means wanted him not to go back to Jerusalem, but to become the leader of some movement, and he declined. Now, why was he able to do this with people of all backgrounds? Because he had a beautiful personality and he learned the art of how to use persuasive conversation to reach people. And I think that we can do this. Just begin with people in our immediate environment uh, and bring up questions. You know, Jesus was an expert with using questions and we don't need to make it difficult and get into concepts that are so esoteric that many people can't follow them. Parts one, two, and three talk about some concepts that even though I've had been reading the book for years, they still I still got to read it 10 times and still I will say I need to come back to this another time and wrestle with it. We don't need those concepts to help a person to come into the kingdom. And if we use those beautiful concepts that we've learned that Jesus used, we can make great progress in helping people into the brotherhood. Thank you, Donald. Thank you. How do we do that? <clears throat> uh, that's another good question. How do we become like Jesus? How do we become the living Jesus in our life? Uh, I believe sometimes we can talk about Jesus without mentioning his name. You know, we, we can be that Jesus, the one we, we want. So Barbara and then Jenny. Thank you everyone and Gaetan for this wonderful session. I wanted to add, and Gaetan said the word, a word that helps me a lot in doing all of these things. And that's the word relationship. When you think about family, it's about relationships. And I wanted to bring it back to what Gaetan was saying about peace, um, peaceful relationships. And of course, if one is at peace within oneself and relationship to God, as we understand God, then 
that peace is is something that is shared non-verbally as well as just by presence. Jesus taught so much uh, to people without saying a word, just by his his peaceful presence and his gracious love. So um, I did want to add a couple of other things. When I do talk about relationship, this whole matter of gender, since I'm a woman in the generation where all of that really started, um, I always tell people, well, if you think of God as a father, how did he become a father? You couldn't be a father without a mother. And in fact, that is the concept of the Trinity that we have in the Urantia book, which is a really difficult concept, the Trinity, to talk to people about. But just getting people to think in terms of the motherhood of God, it is real um, in, in the Urantia book, and it is the eternal son, and then um, our creative mother spirit, and eventually God the supreme. Um, the, the primacy that is true, is is God. Um, and many do call him father, but not all. The planets, the ones who have experienced a bestowal son, especially a creator son, tend to use the word father. So, so I've been become very comfortable with the motherhood of God and the concepts of the motherhood of God and the aspects of God that are motherly, just as there are aspects of God that are childlike uh, in the infinite spirit. Uh, we're all literally in relationship as family. So I just wanted to share that there are many ways um, with my friends who don't use the word God. Um, the Urantia book gives us deity and divinity and the concept that, that God is, <laughs> is more than, than personal. So we really have been given these glorious um, options, I guess I think of it, <laughs> as, as ways to go by meeting people where they are and loving them in ways that work and are peaceful. Thank you, Barbara, thank you. <clears throat> and it makes me think that it don't matter how we think about God, that as long as we have a concept, a loving concept of God, whether mm -hmm. it's a mother or a father, as long as that concept make us evolve and treat the other human being around us as brother and sister, well, that's good enough for me, you know, it should be good enough for a lot of people. Thank you. Yes, Jane. Thank you, Gaetan. I would like to contribute to answer your question, how we become Jesus. I think this is a great question. And Indirantia book says that uh, we need to be spiritually transformed, being born of the spirit, receiving the connection with the living vine that is the spirit of truth, and then producing many fruits of the spirit, which are exactly being like Jesus was in his human life. So the fruits of the spirit is being like Jesus. So if you produ produce a many fruits of the spirit, which are expressions of divine love, we can transform this world. We can become living Jesus, working again in earth in the life of those who dare uh, to live the Jesus teachings. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. That made me think about, a, I don't know the exact quote word for word, but I remember the sense of it, that the effort you put trying to convince someone of something determines the degree of which by which you have acquired that truth. So the more you want to convince someone about some things that you believe in, the more effort you put in it, it means that it's how far you are from actually living that truth because Jesus didn't have to convince anyone. He was that living truth. So becoming Jesus for me is like the more we are like him, the easier it's going to be to convince other people what we are or what Jesus is or what he was proclaiming to be. So let's move on to the brotherhood of man. The, we don't have much time to explore that subject, but we did explore it in some way. So I'm gonna share my screen again to share with you a few quotes, and then we'll probably have, uh, that'll be the end of it. We'll, we'll have some comments made, and then uh, we'll probably close the, uh, the session. So I'm gonna share my screen about these quotes, and I'm gonna read it with you. The brotherhood of man, the acceptance of the doctrine of the fatherhood of God 
implies that you also freely accept the associated truth of the brotherhood of man. And if man is your brother, he is even more than your neighbor, whom the father requires you to love as yourself. Your brother being of your own family will not only love with a family affection, but you will also serve as you would serve yourself. Grow in grace by means of that living faith, which grasps the fact that you are the son of God, while at the same time, it recognizes every man as a brother. And thus do the doctrine of the father of God makes imperative the practice of the brotherhood of men. The worship of God and the service of men became the sum and substance of his religion. They were talking about Jesus. Jesus revealed and exemplified a religion of love, security in the Father's love with joy and satisfaction, consequent upon sharing this love in the service of the human brotherhood. And I'm going to read the last quote about the brotherhood. I got many more, but the, the time is going short. Grow in grace by means of that living faith which grasp the fact that you are the son of God, while at the same time you recognize every man as a brother. So I have a question about this. How does the doctrine of the brotherhood of man affect or influence your life? How, how well can you live that truth? How well do you grasp that truth in your daily life? When you look at everyone you meet in your daily life, at work, while you go shopping, while you go walking, while you go to church, uh, while you engage with someone else. Yes, Alfonso, go ahead. Well, in my experience, it is it's a practice. It's something that I do. Um, treat others, you know, cheer them up, trying to say a word of uh, encouragement or just to have a good moment, you know. It, that's, that's, that's my my approach. Like the moment the moment I, I try to interact with others is just to be, believe in uh, making making it feel worth, you know. That is that is that is. I mean, we, if 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 my if my acts does not tell him that he is worthy, you know, mm -hmm. or you know, or being loved and being cared for, I mean, that's what I that's what I, I I try to do. That's what I try to accomplish anywhere I go. Like you were saying, you go to a restaurant, go to the store, go to the cash, you know, everything. It's a word or two. It, it encourage them, and it's always you know. It always worked in my experience, you know, they always, I left them with a smile on his face and just a, a moment, a moment of happiness. And that's how I, I, I uh, and also I, I wanted to add a little bit about what do we have? What is that we got in our hands? How we treat what the, the gift that, that the universe gave us. Because, because what we try to, put forward is a message of love. So we have to treat what we have love first and then to to put, put, put it forward, you know, but we have to appreciate what our book, our revelation. And and I, I, would, I encourage my my and my study groups, others, hey listen, let's 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 respect the punctuation. Let's just respect the commas, you know, and the stops and whatever. So we can hear what is the, the, the message, you know, as they as using the same technique they use, you know, for, for they use to to transfer those thoughts and messages with care and love, you know. So if we don't appreciate that, we don't see that on that, you know, this is what, what we're trying to do, a message of love. You know, everything that we're trying to do has to be with a little bit of, of caring and, and loving uh, spark, you know, that's, that's how I, I, I uh, that's my experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alfonso. Good point to point out the potentials in people, the quality in people, and 
do good words to them, say good words to them, to bring a smile to their lips, you know, to enlighten their days, you know. Sometimes you just say, hi, how are you? Oh, you look good today, you know. I remember the other day I went to a restaurant and the, the young girls had a beautiful hairdo. So I said, geez, you have marvelous hair, you know, beautiful. And she was so proud, you know. Sometimes there's just little thing we might say to someone that makes their day better. And this is what how to treat, I think, it starts by expressing what real brotherhood is. Karan. Um, yeah, you're, talk, you're talking a lot of stuff, but you're not really saying anything. Seriously. Oof. Come on. Okay, so um, the first uh, thing that I, um, I, I would like to mention is the oriental salutation that goes like namaste, which yeah, uh, means... Yeah, like cool. Which, which means um, uh, the presence of God within me salutes the presence of God within you. And when I'm in a crowd and I think namaste, realizing that all the people gathered in that crowd are indwelled, directly indwelled by the presence of our Father. And that the Father loves each person equally and attach the same importance to each person, irrespective of uh, their, their sex, their social status, their level of education, their ethnic group, uh, whether or not they're not, healthy not or not. Though, bro. So uh, the father does respects each and every individual equally. He confers uh, special and horrific prerogatives to the creator's sons, but that's another thing. Uh, just knowing that enhances uh, and, and sharing that enhances the capacity that we have to engage uh, in the, uh, the service the bro of brotherhood. And uh, it's always refreshing to remind that. It brings us a, a higher consideration of our fellows. Uh, and it has major social impacts in life. The moment we, be we begin to live in accordance with this uh, higher uh, recognition of human uh, brotherhood. Uh, it changes everything at every level of our lives. And collectively, the moment, imagine just for a moment, you draw a circle, put six or seven person who dedicates their life to the doing of our universal father's will. At the center of that circle, there's the presence of the father in paradise. That's a new form of governance. This is a new governance for life. And the moment humanity will embrace this new form of governance, everything dedicated to the doing of our Father's uh, uh, will and the sharing of the fruit of the Spirit uh, among us, the whole world would transform in ways that we cannot even imagine. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, it will transform the world. Thank you. Jeffrey, you had your, your hands up in the air. I was just going to say that uh, last month I took up this this project of uh, taking my marriage to the next level. And there are many aspects that I won't mention. But to me, the most fundamental aspect is that we're brothers and sisters. And when I look at the teachings uh, in terms of, of uh, loving as a brother, uh, that has been extraordinarily beneficial. That's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you. You, you were talking about your, I think you were talk, mentioning your spouse, your relationship with your spouse. And, and, and that's a good point. Sometimes we forget the person we live with. And I, I for myself, I, I'm guilty of that sometimes. You know, I, my wife, you know, deserve a lot more than I gave her. And, you know, brotherhood start with the people close to us. And if we can't do that with the people closest to us, how can we do that with other people outside of our close circle? And th the other difficulty I had was trying to grasp the concept of the brotherhood when I look at people, you know, like going to the bank and looking at people when I'm standing online. Hey, th this guy in front of me is my brother. This woman in front of me is my sister. How do I grab this idea? How can I see them as brother and sister? And then I reversed that. I said, well, 
maybe I cannot see them as a brother and sister, but maybe I can act as a brother to them. And for me, that change of perspective, how I was seeing the brotherhood. Because I could not encompass the old humanity as being my brother and sister, but I can sure encompass the idea that I'm a brother to all of them. That was easier for me to grasp. Maybe my brain is wired that way. Anyway, so thank you very much, everyone, for sharing that. Uh, I will make uh, share with you this last quote as a conclusion to this, uh, to this presentation. So what has happened to these men whom Jesus had their name to go forth preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the fatherhood of God, and the brotherhood of man? And then the people of another age will better understand the gospel of the kingdom when it is presented in terms expressive of the family relationship. When men understand religion as the teaching of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men, sonship with God. So what happened to those men that they were told to go out and preach the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men? That's the question I would leave with you. When we were reading the Rensha book, of course, wanted to share the whole book with everyone. And I don't, you know, I'm no exception to that. But today, what I want to share more is that relationship with God and with the others. How do we do that together? And I believe that if all of us that are students of Drencia book, all the many of us, there are thousands of us now in the world, we start really embracing that truth of the Father of God and the brother of man. I mean, embracing, living it not only talking about it, not only intellectually grasping the concept, but grasping the concept spiritually. And that includes love, that includes faith, that includes rendezvous with our Father every day. How can we become what we want to teach if we don't take a rendezvous with the one who's giving us that power to be God? So think about this as your mission as a reader of the Rensha book. What is it you're trying to share? Share about the stars, share about the Demony, share about the rest of the book. But didn't Jesus say before you talk about the beauty of the kingdom, make sure that you bring first the people in the kingdom. Then after that, you can talk about all the beauty of the kingdom. But sometimes we try to tell them about the beauty of the kingdom before they ever enter the kingdom. And for them to enter the kingdom, for me, anyway, for my own belief, is that they accept God. Whatever, as a mother or a father or as a friend, but at least they accept God in their life. And then they accept that brotherhood. And then they start living it. But to do that, we need to be that truth. We need to live that truth. We need to express that truth in everything we do. And that's quite a challenge. So my brother and sister, I challenge you to this truth, to live as a true son of God and as a brother or sister to all. So thank you all for your sharing, for everything you've said that enriched my concept of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And thank you, Jamie, for your masterful management of this uh, webinar. It's a great help to all of us. Thank you all. It's my pleasure and my honor to serve you, to serve everyone. Thank you, Gethan. You did a wonderful job. And thank you, everyone, for coming, for sharing your view, your thoughts, and your love. That is the most important. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ketan, again. God bless you. Until next time.